Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Vinu Sandhu. It's the 8th of September 2023 and here are the questions we'll be answering today. Why does Tata want Haldirams on its plate? Is China winning the chip war? Is it time to bargain hunt speciality chemical stocks? And India or Bharat? Here is what the Constituent Assembly decided. Reports of the mighty Tata group wanting a chunk of Haldirams took many by surprise. But soon both the groups issued denials. The reported move came close on the heels of the conglomerate's attempt to acquire another popular brand, Bislery. The question is, why does Tata want Haldirams on its plate? Kasuri Akhil and Sanket Kaul bring you the answer. Tata Group's consumer unit is reportedly in talks to buy at least 51% of popular Indian snack brand Haldirams. However, Tata Consumer Products has denied any contact with the snacks brand. A spokesperson of the company said it does not comment on market speculations. Haldirams 2 issued a statement to address the matter, denying any reports regarding the stake sale or engagement in any discussions with the Tata Group's consumer arm. News agency Reuters on 6th September said that although Tata was interested in the buyout, it wasn't comfortable with the proposed $10 billion valuation sought by Haldirams and that it was a tall ask. Haldirams started as a small sweet shop in the quaint city of Bikaner in Rajasthan. Over the years, it catapulted to become one of the most popular local brands in the country in sweets and savouries. According to reports, the snack giant has almost 13% share of India's $6.2 billion snack market. It has garnered overseas popularity too, with products sold in over 80 countries. Considering Haldiram's popularity in India and overseas, is the demand for a $10 billion valuation a fair ask? Let me give you a small bit of perspective. Bikaji Foods is Haldiram's smaller rival. It is listed on stock exchanges. Its market cap, which is the total of the value of its shares, is about $1.5 billion. That is six times its annualized revenue. According to available reports, Haldiram's revenue in 2021-22 was close to $1 billion, six times that. If we use the same parameter as Bikaji, will be $6 billion. However, according to unconfirmed reports, Haldiram's current revenue is closer to $1.5 billion. Six times that will be $9 billion. Now, let me hasten to add that in a deal like this, there are things involved which go beyond simple mathematical calculation. Let me also add that Tata consumer shares rose when Reuters first reported a possible deal and they fell when the deal was denied. I will leave you to munch on it. Have some bujia. Meanwhile, Tata Consumer Products has a strong foothold in the beverage segment and owns brands like Tata Tea and Tetley. It is the world's second largest manufacturer and distributor of tea. The company also has a joint venture with Starbucks to own and operate Starbucks cafes in India. Tata's consumer unit is relatively a small part of the Tata Group in terms of annual turnover. At the 60th AGM of the company in June, Tata Sun's chairman N. Chandrasekharan expressed his intention of expanding the consumer arms business across new categories and making it into a complete FMCG company is in the works. So what would an acquisition of a majority stake in Haldirams mean for the Tata Group? In terms of what it will do for TCPL, is it will give them a very, very strong presence, of almost like a leadership role from nowhere uh, in the savory snacks market, which is large, which is growing. And uh, the organized market share within that grows tremendously. That's big, a big plus. Two is, I think it will bring a lot of synergies for TCPL across their portfolio, given that they are in beverages, they are in water, but they also have the ownership of the Starbucks franchise in India. I think it brings a lot of synergies to so it can have, uh, you know, a huge multiplier effect. 
Tata Consumer Products' pursuit of organic and inorganic growth strategies is aimed at ramping up its presence in the food and beverage space and for competing directly with Pepsi and Reliance Retail. The predominant impression about the conglomerate's FMCG arm is that it is a tea company. In light of its larger goal to identify as an FMCG giant, Tata's rationale behind the reported purchase seems plausible especially after its recent unsuccessful attempt to acquire Bislery. Tata Steel, meanwhile, is keeping a close eye on China. The neighboring country consumes half of the world's steel and its recovery is crucial to the industry. A Chinese multinational company, Hawaii, meanwhile pulled a surprise recently. It came out with a 5G smartphone with advanced 7nm chips. This was despite a ban placed by the United States and its allies on foreign chip technology. So is China winning the chip war? Tariq Ahmed has the answer. One of China's largest tech companies, Huawei Technologies, came out with its latest smartphone in the last week of August. Mate 60 Pro is being billed as China's answer to the US's iPhone. And experts believe, through this phone, China has also sent across a message to the West that sanctions can be counterproductive. And the devil, as they say, is in the details. It's not the phone, but a tiny part which has sent out shockwaves. At the heart of Mate 60 Pro is an advanced system-on-chip processor or 7 nanometer semiconductor chip. It has led to hushed concerns in the US. And it is believed that the chip was manufactured by Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp or SMIC a partly Chinese government-owned semiconductor foundry company. This has been the most advanced chip that SMIC has ever produced. Previously, 14 nanometer was the most advanced chip that SMIC was able to manufacture. In October last year, US President Joe Biden had announced curbs on shipments of semiconductors used for artificial intelligence and chip-making tools. The Netherlands and Japan too joined the US. The aim was clear, to make sure that China is not only deprived of the advanced chips, but also of the tools to make them. And in 2020, the US barred SMIC from acquiring the extreme ultraviolet lithography technology from Netherlands-based ASML, which is critical in manufacturing 7 nanometer chips. But Despite all the odds, SMIC producing an advanced chip suggests that China has been making progress in building a domestic chip ecosystem. So, is China winning the chip war against the West? The sanctions will not have any impact on China. China will grow. China has already handled, uh, you know, created a complete capacity and, you know, capability internally to do much bigger things than what uh, people have all, ever thought of. Okay? As per you know, any of the technology, whether it is artificial intelligence or uh, chip manufacturing, anything, they have invested quite a lot and they have been far ahead of many other countries, including the Western countries in the world. Okay? So sanction from Western world will not have any major impact on the growth of China. It will have a counter impact on Western world Tech Insights Inc., a semiconductor information platform, had said in 2022 that to create 7 nanometer chips, SMIC might have been tweaking simpler ASML machines that were with them before the sanctions were imposed. But experts are suggesting that without the extreme ultraviolet lithography technology, only 50% of fewer chips will turn out to be usable. Today, the world's most advanced chips are made by a single company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company or TSMC, which can produce 3 nanometer chips. And 
the machines for producing advanced chips are only made at Netherlands ASML. Japan contributes to the value chain by providing other basic items needed for manufacturing and the US creates the software for designing the chips. Now, reports say that China is set to launch a new state-backed investment fund that aims to raise about $40 billion for its semiconductor sector. Previously, in 2014 and 2019 too, China invested huge funds targeting the two big chip manufacturing entities, SMIC and Hua Hong Semiconductor. But these investments didn't help China to disrupt the international semiconductor value chain. So, what's the current state of China's semiconductor ecosystem? All this news about 7 nanometer Korean chip from basically SMIC for Huawei, it may be true, but basically at this point of the time, my take on this thing is that even if they are able to manufacture 7 nanometer technology, this will not be very high yielding technology. They will have to do much more work to basically make it high yielding and commercially viable this, uh, technology, right? That's the fab side. There is basically another side, which is semiconductor equipment manufacturing, like ASML manufactures semiconductor equipment. So there is this company, Shanghai SMEE, right? Uh, Shanghai Manufacturing Electronics. Uh, uh, I think they are also very close to basically developing the advanced uh, semiconductor manufacturing machinery. China, meanwhile, may not stop. And sometimes its timing can be perplexing too. The Huawei phone was released during the visit of the United States Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Her department was responsible for all the tech sanctions. In a similar move, China had unveiled its J-20 stealth fighter aircraft during the visit of US Secretary of Defense Robert M. Gates. Caught off guard, the US may slap another set of sanctions on China. Shares in SMIC plunged on Thursday after two US congressmen called on the White House to further restrict export sales to the company. Clearly, China has found a way around US sanctions. Paul Triolo, technology policy lead at Washington-based business consulting firm Stonebridge Group, told Washington Post that the new phone was a major blow to all of Huawei's former technology suppliers, most of whom were US companies. Let us now turn our attention to markets. After riding high in 2022, speciality chemical stocks have corrected over 15% from their respective 52-week highs on weak global demand. Should you then use the weakness to buy these stocks or is more downside likely? What should be your investment strategy? Harshita Singh finds out in our next report. India's specialty chemical industry has been bearing the brunt of muted global demand and declining chemical prices for the past few months. The sector saw its profit slump across the board in the recent June quarter as China's reopening and aggressive inventory destocking in the global market pulled prices lower. At the bourses, the stocks have corrected as much as 50% from their record highs touched over the past two years. Once considered expensive, the shares are now much cheaper as against their peak PE multiples, raising the question whether it's time to bargain hunt these stocks. Analysts, however, believe that the worst is not over. While the recent uptick in crude oil has moved chemical prices up, the demand slump is expected to continue. So recently we have seen a lot of uh, increase in uh, prices of basic chemicals like acetic acid, uh, methanol, uh, ethanol, other things. Primarily because these things are all uh, crude oil and gas derivatives. But because of demand issues, uh, we have not seen that end product prices have been going commensurately. So as a result of that, we believe that uh, although uh, chemical companies have uh, come off for their high valuations that we have seen in last two years, we still believe that there could be pressure on uh, valuation and performance of these companies on the stock exchanges. So as a result of which, we don't think that uh, these companies are attractive despite the downturn that we have seen in the valuations. 
echoing this view, analyst at Incred Equities in a recent note said that demand problems continue and raw material inflation will likely follow in coming quarters. Thus, it's not the right time to do bottom fishing in the sector as the bottom is still far away. Analysts expect the current fiscal to be a washout year for the sector. Hence, they suggest that investors with a longer time horizon wait for more correction before buying the shares in this space. With the rising input price led by the crude, there could be a margin squeeze scenario that would be witnessed. We do not see any greater improvement in the financials for the chemical sector in the current financial year. If anything to happen, I think next year only that we should see any improvement. But this year could be a period of a washout. But I think in the longer run, targeting longer run, one can think about accumulating stocks. Uh, accumulating in the sense, if post quarterly number stocks correct by more than 10%, then one should be ready to add further. Among individual picks, Vinity Organics and Naveed Florine are the top long-term structural plays as per Sunendu Bhushan of Prabhudas Liladhar, while Patra of Philip Capital counts SRF, RT Industries and Gujral Fluorochemicals as his top bets. Today, on September 8, the Lal Street action will remain stock-specific, while traders will also keep an eye on crude oil prices. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard Financial markets are also keeping a keen eye on the G20 summit. Analysts believe it will bring investments and open trade opportunities. But before the final round of meetings, a dinner invite sent by the President has ignited a debate. It was sent in the name of President of Bharat instead of President of India. But how did the debate pan out when the Constituent Assembly was taking a call on it? Rimjim Singh takes you down memory lane. Article 1 of the Constitution states that India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states and the territory of India consists of states, union territories specified in the first schedule and other acquired territories. On September 17, 1949, B.R. Ambedkar tabled the final version of the provision to the House, which included both Bharat and India. Several members of the House were against the use of India as they said it was a reminder of the colonial past. Independence activist Seth Govindas preferred Bharat over India and several other members agreed as they said that India was a substitute for Bharat in the English language. Thus said India that is Bharat are not beautiful words for the name of a country and it should rather be Bharat known as India. Lok Sabha member Hari Vishnu Kamat said that the word India was only a translation of Bharat. Das said that the Vishnu Purana and Brahma Purana mentioned the name Bharat. He added that by naming our country as Bharat, we are not doing anything which will prevent us from marching forward. Kamat suggested Bharat or Bharat Varsha or Bharat Bhumi as possible names that are derived from scriptures. He said historians and philologists have dwelled deep into this matter of the name of this country, especially the origin of this name, Bharat. Some ascribe it to the son of Dushyant and Shakuntala, who was also known as Sarvadamana or All Conqueror and who established his kingdom in this ancient land. After him, this land came to be known as Bharat. In the House, Ambedkar said that the civilization debate was unnecessary since the name Bharat was not opposed by any of the members of the House. Kishori Mohan Tripathi, a member of the Constituent Assembly, said that the word Bharat reminds everyone of the past glory of India. 
Following his comment, Ambedkar asked if this was necessary. There is a lot of work to be done, he said before the motion was adopted. Meanwhile, citing Turkey as an example, a UN spokesperson has said that the world body will consider if India submits a request to change the name. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log into our website business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.